Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. There's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about today and a bunch of announcements at the end, so please stay tuned for those. But I'm going to jump right in because we got a big one to start. So as you can imagine, we got to start with the Mega SG. Analog just announced an FPGA-based, Kevtris-designed Sega Genesis uh, that's going to be released in April of next year. The console looks similar in size and shape to the Super NT. It's the same pricing. They're still doing that same thing where they say it's one price, but then charge you an exorbitant amount for shipping. So it ends up being about $220. Um, and it, it looks incredible. And I got to say, um, having an FPGA Genesis might be a little bit more important than some of the others, just because of how flawed the video output is in so many, if not every single model of the Genesis. So as an example, if you took a PlayStation or a Sega Saturn and you used some really high quality cables with it, you can get a near perfect solution with zero mods, but that is just impossible with every revision of the Genesis. Sure, some are better than others, but you need sometimes pretty advanced mods in order to get video quality that's still, in many occasions, far from perfect. So having this might just be a great solution to that. Um, last year, Analog announced that there was going to be an analog adapter, no pun intended, um, that plugs into the HDMI port of the Super NT and could output different uh, analog video signals from RGB on up. Uh, there's been really pretty much no word whatsoever on that since, and I'm guessing it's because Kevtris was probably hard at work on this and not able to work on any other projects, but I hope that's released soon because I think pairing that with this would be a really, really great thing for any Sega fans. And uh, sticking in the same vein as Sega and all of their accessories for their products back in the day, uh, Analog is also offering cartridge adapter accessories that allow you to play Master System, SG-1000, the Sega card, and even Game Gear games. So this thing's really gonna be the ultimate Sega FPGA console. And, you know, obviously if the quality is even close to as good as Kevtris' other cores, we're really looking at a high quality thing here. Um, also, it looks like there's a port on the side that will allow it to interface with a Sega CD unit, which I think is awesome. But those Sega CD units are starting to get old and wear out. Uh, many, in fact, I would say it's more common than not that you're gonna find them requiring a capacitor replacement and definitely some kind of uh, rubber, rubber band replacement, just uh, at least for the Sega CD Model 1s. So I would have liked to have seen some kind of other Sega CD solution. And I'm kind of curious about uh, what they're gonna do about the 32X. Cause I don't think, now this is total speculation, but I don't think uh, you could do 32X inside of the same box like that. I think the last time I spoke to Kevtris about this, years ago, by the way, before this was an idea, probably even a serious idea, um, when I talked to him back in the days of the Analog NT Mini, he kind of felt that you might need two FPGA chips to do that because it's essentially running one video through the other. So there's no mention of will this play 32X games and there's no mention of will it interface with the original which might be a bit of a nightmare anyway, because even with an RGB output, you would need specialty cables. And then there's of course the different brightness issues that you'd have to worry about. So I'm sure between all of us nerds, we could come up with a solution, but uh, you know, you could also, you could look at these things like, you know, what a great product. Why are you focusing on a couple of things that don't matter? But you know, like I said, that's kind of one of the things that I loved about Sega was that they had all of these different adapters and accessories and cool stuff. And sometimes it was really awesome, like the power base converter. And sometimes it was really dumb, like the 32X. But we got some cool stuff over the years. And, you know, it, while analog certainly is tackling that with the cartridge adapters and especially the Game Gear, that that's very, very, very cool. Uh, I still... I still wish there would be a little more love for the Sega CD and 32X in there. But uh, anyway, um, I, I would, you know, I purchased two of them. I was able to get in because the website was uh, was down and still is all day since the announcement. I was able to keep refreshing and get in. I got two of them. I sent an email over to the CEO Chris and asked if I could be on the list to do a um, uh, a full review this time. Uh, so. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe I'll get to talk to Kevtris again. Maybe I'll get to do one of the review units. But uh, if you'd like to see uh, my input on this, 
tweet at Analog and let them know that uh, they should be sending me one too, as well as all the other guys. And I promise if I get one early, I will do uh, the best review of something that I've ever done. I promise I will go above and beyond, because not only is this something that I think is awesome, it's something that's been a huge part of my life, both as a kid and in the past few years, chasing perfection from a Genesis. So uh, hopefully I'll get to do a review. Uh, hopefully we'll get to learn more info about this soon. And either way, I'm just pretty excited because I'm obviously a massive and huge fan of Kevtris, and I really would love to support his work. And I hope this thing does really well because, uh, you know, maybe, maybe Analog could make millions of dollars off of this and hire more people so that we could start to see more products like this and uh, more of their ideas come, come to light. Just a quick heads up for any PS3 jailbreakers. The latest version of the firmware, 4.83, supposedly breaks the PS3 exploit jailbreak. So uh, the, some of the main developers are still kind of looking through to see exactly what's broken. But if you either plan on or have a Sony PS3 that's jailbroken with PS3 exploit, do not update to the latest firmware. John Linneman just posted a review of Mega Man 11 on DF Retro, and it is absolutely awesome. All of John's reviews really set the bar for what people should aim for, but probably could never pull off as a great review. Uh, and I just, I'm, I'm so impressed these days when I sit through a video and it hits every question I have and it looks awesome. And, uh, you know, now that I've been doing videos for a while, I have even more of an appreciation for this than before. But uh, he goes through and compares the different versions. One thing that he noted was that the Switch version doesn't have anti-aliasing turned on, so you get kind of a sharper, more pixelated image, which I think actually fits. I think having a more retro looking game on the Switch and having a, a smoother, more modern looking game on the PS4 and Xbox One is kind of fitting. And I certainly enjoyed the look of it. Um, he also went through and did lag tests to see which game had more input lag on which console, which was very cool. Uh, and overall, uh, awesome review and a very cool game. I found the game to be a bit frustrating, but um, maybe it's just because I haven't had enough time to sit down and play it. I haven't really had enough time to do much of anything these days, but uh, this definitely stands true to the, the original Mega Man games where you have to play each level a lot to learn the patterns, to learn um, you know exactly where to go, where to stand, to figure out tricks. And it is very satisfying when you pull it off, but uh, some things about it, maybe I haven't hit my groove with it yet. Or may maybe I need to bump down the difficulty level to grumpy old man. But uh, <laughs> either way, um, even... If you were, weren't even 100% sure that you wanted the game or not, I would recommend checking out the review because that should totally solidify it for you either way. And uh, you know, thanks to John for making these videos that are as cool as they are. The team behind the Mr. FPGA project has just updated the IO board to have an ultra low latency controller adapter. So this is pretty impressive because the Mr. FPGA project uses community made cores that are already zero lag when run in analog RGB output mode. It is exactly the same latency as a real console would be. So adding something like this that allows you to use original controllers with, uh, I believe it was tested at 32 nanoseconds of latency. That's faster than, uh, that's faster than I think any game console could pull the controller port anyway. So for all intents and purposes, we're going to call this one a zero lag add-on because I, I don't think it's possible for it to actually add any lag to these games. But uh, yeah, and it's, it's based off of a USB port, but it's not using the USB protocol, which is important. Uh, that way, you're really just using the connector, which is easy, uh, easy to get, and um, it could be interfaced with things like the MC Cthulhu boards. Uh, which is uh, that board that allows you to interface an arcade stick with pretty much every game console out there except a, ha a handful. So this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, I really would love to see a community made, uh, for lack of a better description, imagine a community made Retron 5 or a community made Polymega where you have your root board where you get your FPGA kit uh, and then you have your add-on board, and then you put it in a neat case. And then uh, you could either get 
controller uh, and cartridge adapters, kind of like the Polymega, which I always did think was a cool idea. Or you could do it Retron 5 style, where you have a whole bunch of them and ports around it. I just think something like that would be incredible. And to have a community-based project where we're all testing and adding on to it, I think that would be very cool. So uh, if anybody's interested in any of that stuff, I started a missed page on the website, a Mr. page on the website. At the moment, it's just links on where you could purchase the bare minimums to get these things. Uh, but I hope that it becomes a section of the site that starts to grow pretty quickly. Uh, there's a GitHub page for the project, uh, and a lot of people are starting to contribute. So I got mine, uh, I got the FPGA kit, the USB hub, and uh, the software pack in. And now I just need, I'm waiting on the IO board, which I hope the one that I ordered uh, could allow for this as well. But I will start testing uh, right away pretty much and see what I could do with this thing. Because so far it just looks super promising and it looks like stuff like this is really going to be the future of how we play older consoles. Because when I say the future, throughout all of our lifetimes, we'll probably be able to play the originals no problem. But uh, I doubt our grandkids will be playing on these. Uh, we'll be playing on original consoles. You might need something like this. And, uh, you know, or we're all going to plug into the Matrix and pretend to play it anyway. Who knows how things are going to go. But I just think that this is incredible, and uh, I want to help support the project. And anybody else that's interested should definitely check it out as well. Darksoft just announced that he'll be making a Capcom CPS-1 multi-kit, which is pretty exciting news because a lot of those CPS-1 boards are rare and hard to find. Uh, and let's be honest, arcade boards aren't going to last forever, and the amount of working boards are getting smaller and smaller every year. So having a multi is something that's going to be really helpful for preservation and just straight-up arcade game lovers. Um, I'm a big fan of his CPS2 kit, and uh, I just think that stuff like this is amazing and important. And there's been some really great, great things going on in the Capcom arcade world in the past year with the lockout chips, with Marcus's uh, digital HDMI output adapter. I thought that was amazing. So uh, this is great news, and uh, it's especially good news for people like myself that really love the Street Fighter Championship Edition. I like all the Street Fighter games, but for some reason I think that's my favorite. Maybe it's because I love the box for the Genesis version. I still have. After. <laughs> but uh, either way, uh, I'm excited to try it out. I spoke to Darksoft, and he said that he needs to finish up one other project first before he starts really uh, hitting the ground running with this one. So it seems like a few months away. Um, you know, his projects... Uh, aren't, aren't usually rushed out. I, I mean that in a nice way. That wasn't like a sarcastic dig or anything. So I wouldn't expect that this year, but it is something that uh, it's you know not too far off and something I'll most likely be purchasing as soon as it becomes available. I know there was another one uh, being sold, but uh, it was hard to come by, um, and I think they didn't like to sell out of France, which is strange to me because, I mean, I... I when we're talking about these things, I judge people by ones and zeros, not by where they live or anything. So, uh, whatever. But uh, the Darksoft one will be available worldwide. Um, and there'll be a, a team of people helping you out uh, if you need to get one, if you need support. Uh, those forums that, that Darksoft posts on are usually very helpful. So, uh, I'm very excited to see it. And I'm excited to see what's going to come next for all the other different Capcom arcade boards out there. The Atari Jaguar Pro Controller reproductions are now available for pre-order from the developers. They should ship within a few months, I would guess. Uh, the developer said that the controller shells, buttons, and silicon pads are finished for all 2,000 controllers, and he's just waiting on PCB boards and controller cables before moving to final assembly. So I would guess within a few months, and this definitely looks like something fun that I would want to purchase. Uh, I pre-ordered mine. And you have to pre-order them in pairs, which I still don't really understand. Uh, so I guess I'll have a, a spare one of these available when they arrive. But I'm interested to see how it changes the experience of certain Jaguar games, which I don't think the best controller in the world could, uh, could fix some of those. But who knows? Uh, for my, in my personal opinion, uh, it was worth picking up. I'm still an, a, an odd fan of the Jaguar, and uh, I guess I'll review it once it comes in. The Wii Dual HDMI output kits have arrived to Dan, Citrus 3000 PSI, and he's going to be first releasing them only on completed installations. 
And then once he's made sure that there's no bugs or something popped up that uh, was unexpected, he'll start selling the kits by themselves. Um, it looks like some of these might start to go out within a few days, so the timing is very soon. And uh, I think a lot of people are excited to get this. There's a lot of Wii fans that would really appreciate either the dual output or really just the digital to digital HDMI. Um, and I'm interested to seeing everybody else's opinion when they start getting theirs. Monster Joysticks just released a mini arcade stick with a Sega Master System Atari 2600 style output port. And it uses high quality arcade parts, but it's over $70. So while something like this looks really cool, I've seen people build similar things out of like a Tupperware uh, container. And as silly as that sounds, uh, the one that I saw looked great and it was using the same high quality parts. So uh, I'll leave this one up to you. I'm sure there's a, a very specific and very good use for this. Uh, but for general gaming, I don't know. I think I'd rather spend money on like a Panzer fight stick or something and you know just kind of save up uh, a two button $70 control stick. But, you know, who knows? Maybe there is an Atari 2600 gamer that needs this exact thing. Maybe somebody's building a mini arcade that this would be a perfect fit on, or two of them might be a perfect fit on. So uh, definitely a neat solution. I just wish they would have a more reasonable price for something like this. But check it out if you're interested. I'm going to try to make this one super quick, but there was another CRT modding video. This one got very popular that doesn't go over safety. So I just, I know people are probably tired of hearing it, but there's a lot of people that haven't heard it. So for all of those, please understand that working on a CRT, an arcade machine, open frame power supplies, any of that stuff could be potentially very, very dangerous. Um, I've accidentally leaned over on an open frame power supply and it sucked. I didn't die, I didn't end up in the hospital, but I really wish I didn't do it. And all of that stuff could be avoided if just basic safety was taught in any of these videos. And the thing that gets me is that there is absolutely, without a doubt, a chance that is not zero of serious injury or death. And to put it into perspective, any of the other mods that I've talked about, um, there is zero chance of death as a direct result of the mod. So sure, if you go and try to mod your Super Nintendo in your bathtub, you know, with it plugged in, fine, but that's not a direct result of the mod. That's something else. Whereas the opposite, if you tell somebody take the back off of a CRT and go fishing around for stuff and they grab the wrong thing, that is a direct result of that mod. And you're not going to get that injury in any of the other things that are talked about. So I just want to make it clear once more, please practice correct safety procedures. Please call other people out when they don't. And if anybody disagrees with me, do it in a way where you at least start out with some kind of safety disclaimer. Because I'm going to just straight up ban and block everybody that says otherwise in the comments. And I know a lot of people will probably be pretty upset about that. But the fact is, I'm tired of people saying things like, oh, you're just exaggerating. You know, it's no big deal. You could just do this. Because the fact is, anybody that watches this channel a lot, or any of my friends' channels, have heard it, we know, it's probably subconscious. Anybody that just listens to the podcast would probably open up the back of a CRT and just subconsciously know to stay away from the whole back of the tube part. But a lot of these videos are starting to get a lot of views. People that aren't into electronics, people that aren't in the retro gaming scene normally. And how would somebody know? If somebody says, oh yeah, this is perfectly safe, I'm just going to pop it open, how would anybody know? So please, please, please practice safe modding. And if you're going to make a video, take the two seconds to just tell people there's a potential of serious injury. Even if that potential is one, it's still not zero. So uh, I'll, I'll end my rant now, but, but please, people, don't take this the wrong way. Don't start arguing with me about what's safe and what's not safe. Just don't let anybody get hurt doing this stuff. It's just, it's not cool. And it makes me sad that there's got to be somebody out there that got zapped for no reason. And even if it only ended up just hurting and learning a lesson, it's still something that could have been avoided. So please take it seriously. Watermelon Games says that Paprium is still going to be released and says that they're going to show it off on October 27th in Paris. Um, but then they kind of, basically ask for people to crowdsource the party. 
So they said, uh, your registration is required, dress code. If you want to help and you're part of a jazz band, have rare Mega Drive stuff, have uh, emblematic games, looking for smaller PVMs. Uh, so I, I don't know. Um, do you guys ever, or does anybody still watch South Park? You know the episode where they make fun of Game of Thrones and it's like, oh, the dragons are totally still coming. No, no, you just wait. The dragons are definitely coming. It's, uh, that's kind of what this feels like. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope any negativity in my voice is shoved in my face upon release. I hope I demo a cart and I'm blown away and I have to uh, eat my sarcasm and words and it's the best game ever. I want it to be. But I, uh, it's just been a very weird ride since they first put it up for pre-order. So I'm interested to see how this all pans out. Uh, and hopefully anybody that spent their money pre-ordering it at least gets a game. Because I think we've had a little bit too much of people paying for something and having it go years without getting what they paid for. The company Collector Vision has just launched a Kickstarter campaign for an FPGA-based ColecoVision. The console called the Phoenix will sell for $200, supposedly can play from original cartridges, and support both original and newer controllers, as well as a PS2 keyboard. Which I assume the keyboard would be for people that wanted to use different controllers but still needs number pad support, or maybe even for future Atom computer support if that's ever added. Um, you know, overall, I think the Coleco Chameleon project from a few years ago really tarnished the ColecoVision name, which sucks and it's not fair at all. But when I saw like five or six different people tweet me about this, my initial thought was, oh boy, here we go again, which is not fair at all. Uh, it's, not, it's not what ColecoVision deserves. It's not, uh, you know, that shouldn't be what I think when I hear the name. So uh, hopefully people can get past the Chameleon, which is not this product. And look at this with open eyes and uh, an open mind and kind of see if this is something that fits their knees. The $200 price point, though, um, that's the only thing that kind of feels a little expensive. And I do realize that FPGA stuff is not cheap at all. So I'm not I'm certainly not accusing the company of charging too much. I'm just saying that's a lot of money for a console that, um, you know, you could play other ways and have it incredibly close to the same experience. So I'll leave that up to you guys to decide. Post in the comments what you think. Uh, do you know anything about Collector Vision? Do you know anything about this project? How do you feel about uh, the chameleon tarnishing the name? Am I the only one that thinks that? But uh, let me know your thoughts. And if you're interested, check out the Kickstarter campaign. More updates to the Satitator project. Professor Abrasive just posted another update uh, saying that the current board manufacturer is pretty much refusing to make the boards right. They're basically doing what a lot of these places do and say, well, are you sure you need beveled edges? Well, show me, send me pictures. Well, they're basically just trying to get them to say, oh, forget it, it's fine. I've dealt with that before personally on both small and large scales. So I can only imagine how frustrated he must have been by all of that. But he just basically threw in the towel and said, forget it, I'm gonna go to the bigger manufacturer that's more scalable and probably who he would have used anyway for mass production. The only downside is, as with many larger places like that, there was a longer wait time. So it's going to be a few more weeks before he gets in new production samples. And it might be a little bit longer before it goes into production, but that would be measured in weeks, not months or anything. So overall, I think he made the right choice by doing this. Um, it stinks that sometimes you have to deal with companies that are a little difficult, but what can you do? Either way, I'm extremely thrilled that to finally get my hands on one of these. Uh, I really want to put it through its paces, do speed tests and all that happy stuff. And I still don't know the exact way to pronounce it. So I'm just going to pronounce it a different way each time, uh, just to make sure that I've upset every one of you, not just the few that have commented already. Furtech just posted a few updates in regards to the virtual tap project, the Virtual Boy TV outboard. Uh, first, he said that once he received the stencils, production went a lot quicker. So he's already gotten about a third of the way through the pre-orders. And he also said that once he gets about halfway through, he'll be open sourcing the whole project, which I think is really incredible. Um, you know, I, I'm always happy to pay for stuff like this. And in fact, I pre-ordered two myself and uh, can't wait to try my best to install it into my Virtual Boy, which probably means that I'm going to try fail and then have Cruise fix it for me. 
Sorry, dude. Uh, but I just, I think that's awesome. I'm happy that I got to support the developer. I'm happy that I got to pay a little bit. And I think the fact that it's open source now means that it's probably going to, to evolve or at least last a long time. I'm always afraid of very cool and unique projects that are closed source accidentally disappearing. Um, and just by having it open source means there's more, much more of a chance of it living on. So I'm certainly not saying closed source projects are bad. I'm just saying, uh, you know, when you're done with something, you should open it or uh, do like Furtech does and just, you know, make it until you're, you don't want to make it anymore and then open it. But either way, I'm very excited to get this. I want to do a fun little event with it. Um, I already have a few people I've been talking to, so uh, I'll definitely be showcasing this mod when I get mine in. Let's just put it that way. Furtech also posted a progress update on his Neo Geo FPGA core. On his Patreon page, he showed a video of it working and said that he'd made good progress and just what needs to work on the audio chip next. This is also an open source project, so anybody that wants to contribute can. Uh, and even if you can't contribute to the project, maybe consider uh, subscribing to his Patreon page because I'm certainly a supporter of his and I'm very excited about a lot of the things that he has working on. And if you could contribute to the open source side of things, I think there's a pretty big need for people to have an MVS replacement. So imagine an FPGA board that has dual output, analog and digital. So either JAMA and HDMI or RGB and HDMI, or all three as long as that's cheap and easy and not going to cause a problem. But uh, to have something like that that you could install in an MVS arcade machine to make sure that, you know, now you have a new piece of hardware in there, have it working, but you could also have HDMI out for streaming, I think would be absolutely killer. I also think it would be good for people that maybe have both an arcade machine or an arcade super gun setup on an RGB monitor and a flat screen gaming setup. That way you could just use the same thing on both. But, uh, you know, a lot of MVS boards are starting to age. The caps are dying. A lot of them are leaking out and uh, breaking traces on the board. And I really do think people should take the time to do that. But while these boards are out and being worked on, you know, some people just really want to use their arcade machines and some people like options. So I know for me personally, um, if one of these ever gets up for sale, I'm definitely going to buy it, uh, as well as keep my original hardware. So big thanks to Furtech. I'm very happy to be a Patreon subscriber of his, and if you guys like all the work that he's doing, maybe consider doing the same thing. Atari Age user McRory has just updated the ordering checklist for the Atari 1088 XEL motherboards. So if you were looking to get one of those, um, the price has changed due to availability, but I think there is still an ongoing pre-order list. And uh, for anybody that's new to that project, I guess Essentially, this is a complete redesign of an Atari 8-bit computer motherboard. So it was basically reverse engineered and you use official chips. It's not FPGA or anything like that. And it was built into a mini ITX form factor. So this is a pretty neat idea. This is essentially aiming to be a brand new Atari 8-bit computer, but in a mini ITX case. Um, I don't know too much else about the project, so if there's any cool facts or anything, please post down below. I'd certainly love to hear more about it. I just thought it was really neat that a project like this even existed, so I wanted to share it with everybody. New footage was just posted of an Atari Jaguar homebrew arcade racer. The game is tentatively titled Not Outrun, because it's obviously very heavily influenced from the Outrun game. And it looks very cool. The graphics look great. Um, uh, it's still a work in progress, but it just looks like a pretty neat arcade style racer and something that I would normally really love playing. Um, there's no word on any kind of release date or an updated demo. And the project's been in the works since 2015. So um, I don't think the developer is in a rush to get it out, which is, you know, it's a good thing. Uh, but anybody that wants to give it a try or see more footage in person can check it out at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo. And uh, I hope at least one stage is released as a demo. I really like it when developers do that because there's very often hype for games where the hype is great and the game aren't. And there's more often the opposite. There's more often not enough hype for an amazing game. So uh, I think releasing one level to the public for us to play with would probably be a great way to show off what a cool game this is. But uh, I'm looking forward to playing it myself and hopefully on an upcoming Jaguar SD cart. Saint, talking to you. And it looks like the Retro Roundtable is going to be tonight, Wednesday the 17th. 
I know I said that a few weeks ago and it ended up not happening. Uh, there was just schedule conflicts and, and life things in the way. It's so much harder scheduling a live event because, uh, you know, everybody's going to be there. But supposedly it's really going to happen for reals. We're all going to be there and uh, I really hope as many people can join as possible. There's a few things I wanted to mention before I went. First of all, a few people have asked to be writers on Retro RGB, and so far, so good. Uh, people have written some great stuff. It's nice to see things coming in that I wouldn't have caught right away, and it's also really cool to see other people write about the same type of things that I would have written about, too. So uh, it, I'm really happy that this is coming together. Um, I guess the end goal would be if uh, at least one person who covers every type of forum and then more general news and guides and stuff. So once again, if you're interested, uh, so far it's been great and uh, everybody's been really wonderful and hopefully we could uh, keep all this going and really try to grow the site and eventually make it something that's really just an open community site. And uh, I, I certainly have made very strong efforts over the years to always introduce myself as Bob from Retro RGB, not as Retro RGB, because I kind of always felt like the site was much bigger than one person. I really hoped it would take off to, to something else, and it looks like we're on the way to doing that. So thank you very much to the writers who are contributing. Um, a few more people have just signed up in the past few days, so I guess we'll see more stories. Um, and also, I will be traveling in the next week to a few different parts of the country, and uh, I'm going to be doing some interviews, have some cool videos and stuff for everybody, and I'll post those uh, either as they happen or if they need editing, who knows how long it'll take me. I'll try to get it up quickly. Uh, there's a small chance I might do some meetups in Chicago and LA, but to be honest, I don't know if I'm going to have time, so I don't want to set anything in stone, but please follow me on Twitter. I'll definitely give everybody a heads up if I'm going to be out partying somewhere. And, uh, you know, as always, I'd love to meet everybody that could come out and hang out with us. And because I'm going to be traveling next week, Smoke Monster will be doing the roundup next week for me. So it'll still be on this channel, but Smoke Monster has very graciously offered to do this. Uh, it's a huge help on me because while part of me thinks it might have been fun shooting the podcast on the go somewhere, um, not this week. Too much going on. Uh, you know, I, I would love to be somebody that just traveled around the world and set up their camera in a hotel room somewhere and, and did my podcast from there. But uh, this week I tried to jam as much as possible into one, into one setting. So thank you very, very much to Smoke Monster. It'll still air on this channel. Um, I'm just going to have him take care of everything, you know, talk about all of the news posts and we'll see how that goes. But uh, I'm excited to, to be able to, to just listen for once and, not, uh, and really be on the other side of the screen, which might sound cheesy, but whatever. Um, so, as always, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you so much to all of my Patreon supporters who are the sole reason that this is still possible. I really appreciate all of you, and uh, I hope to see you guys soon.